wanted to share a little bit for the past few months we've been doing on Sunday afternoon what we call Bible drills and skills and thrills. And mostly we've just played a lot of fun games, but all of our games was um, learning uh, the Bible, books of the Bible, important scriptures that they can hide in their heart, as well as important passages. They have done a very good job. We have a small group It's been a lot of fun, and they want to share with you a little bit about what they've done in the past few months. Okay, Brennan, what's the first book of the Bible? Genesis. How many books in the Bible talk about Jesus? All of them. He's three. All right, Deborah, what's the first book of the Bible? Genesis. How many parts are in the Bible? Old Testament and New Testament. How many books are in the Bible? Sixty-six. I'm going to let Janice go first. They're each going to tell you a division of the Bible and a Bible verse that they're hiding in their heart. Genesis 1-1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Genesis 1-1. Books of the major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and Daniel. <laughs> Psalms 118.24. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad today. Psalms 118.24. Poetry. poetry Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Songs of Song. Isaiah 48. The grass dies and the flowers fall, but the word of our God will live forever. Isaiah 48. The books of the law, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Exodus 20:12. Honor your father and your mother, and you will live a long time in the land. The Lord your God will give you this land. Exodus 20:12. The, ma- the minor prophets are Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zeph- Zephaniah, Haggai, Ze- Zechariah, Malachi. protection in times of trouble. He knows who trusts in him. Nahum 1-7. The books of history are Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. Okay, Deborah, tell us what Isaiah 48 says. Um, the grass dies, the flowers fall, but the word of God will live forever. (laughs) 
Okay, girls, how many books are in the Old Testament? How many in the New Testament? How many divisions have we studied? Five. What are they? Janice, what's the difference between the major prophets and the minor prophets? major prophets are bigger and the minor prophets are smaller. The size of the books. <laughs> Thank y'all. I, I almost forgot. They, um, we have fun um, finding scripture in the Bible just to see who can do it the fastest. And Mr. Cameron has something for them to do. Where's your Bibles? One of the things that we do is that we try to get them, they, they race a little bit, we just pick a verse and we get them to try to find it as fast as they possibly can. Uh, but we also stress to them that it's not that big of a deal that they find it as fast as they can. We just, that's just to make it fun and everything, but we just want them to be able to learn how to use the Bible, you know, because there's going to come a time whenever they may need to find something, and so we're trying to get them to learn how to, to get in there and get to the right chapter and the right verse and everything. So, anyway, normally we start off with them sitting down. Do y'all want to sit down or do y'all want to Okay. <laughs> and everybody has to put the Bible in their lap and put their hands on their head. Okay. All right, so what I want you to find is Proverbs 31, verse 25. Proverbs 31, verse 25. Okay, got it? On your mark, get set, go. Strength and honor are, are her clothings. She shall rejoice in time to come. Thank y'all. Um, thank you for Miss Annie has worked with the preschoolers and Courtney and Cameron has helped myself with the um, first through sixth grade. Thank y'all for helping. Okay, y'all ready? We're going to do Andrew's songs. So, uh... I'm sorry. They're, well, we are so proud of them, but they want to say all 66 books. Can they do that for y'all? I forgot to have them do that, and they're like, we forgot, we forgot. I'm so proud of them, y'all. 
and I'm sorry I forgot. All right, are you ready? All right, talk loud. Good evening. Did you bring a Bible with you? Hold up your Bible. Let me take a look at it tonight. Good. You're going to need it tonight. We're going to read about 30-something verses of Scripture. We're going to cover a long passage of Scripture tonight, and my goal is to have you in bed by 11.30 or 12 o'clock tonight. Uh, but now if that happens, it'll be because you stayed up watching television a long time after I finished. <clears throat> we're, going to, we're going to read, uh, pick it up in chapter 5, verse 12 through 42. And I'm going to make several comments, but I want to start off by saying that when the church is pure, uh, what happened this morning in the, in the church? Do y'all remember the New Testament church we studied this morning? There, were, there was a couple. What happened to them? Uh, and Ananias and Sapphira, uh, they lied to God. They lied to the body of Christ. God, God took them out, moved them out of the way, and it brought fear and wonder, and uh, everybody was in awe of everything that was taking place. In other words, God purified the church. And when he purified the church, then all of these other circumstances are going to start to happen in such a way it's going to cause the gospel to go out as quickly as possible. One of the signs that the church is filled with people pursuing holiness and people who are really longing to obey God is the things that begin to happen and they become unexplainable. There used to be an author that I used to read about 25 years ago for when the ministry, and his name was Henry Blackaby. And Henry Blackaby would always say that you can tell whether God is at work in a church or not because if there are unexplainable things that are taking place in the church, then that's God that's causing those things to take place. And that's absolute true. As God's people, we walk in the way. And I talked a little bit about that last week, that the whole book of Acts is about walking in the way. Now what happens when we walk in the way is God manipulates circumstances. He causes particular sets of events to happen so that his desire will come to pass in the lives of the people who are following him and in the church. Now often good things that shouldn't happen do actually happen. Now what we're going to see tonight in the text is all the apostles. Does anybody know how many apostles there are at this point in the church? Somebody say 12. 12. Now, 11 was a good, was a good answer, but it's just wrong because we knew that Judas had died and there was now 11 and Paul is not an apostle yet because he hadn't been called, but there is Matthias who got elected to fill the other spot, so he's there. So I can see why you would come up with 11, but there's 12 of them right now. They go down to the synagogue and they start preaching. And when they start preaching, it's going to make the Sanhedrin mad and the people who rule the area of Jerusalem. So they're going to throw all 12 of them into prison. Now, we're only going to hear the names of Peter. We're going to maybe hear the name of John or something. But it's going to say the apostles because it's thrown all of them in jail. And what's going to be a really amusing thing that you're going to see in here is after they get thrown in jail, the Sanhedrin is going to call, a count, to call the council together so they can sit and decide how they're going to handle these new radical apostles apostles that are out here and then they're going to decide we've got to figure out what to do and they're going to say go get the apostles and bring them out of jail and they're going to find out that sometime during the middle of the night while everybody was wide awake and all the guards were there an angel comes in escorts the 12 out of there. They've already gone back to the synagogue and gone back to preaching the gospel where they were and the synagogue and the rulers are over here fighting and arguing about what they're going to do about it and they're already back out in the streets proclaiming the word of God. This amazing thing that is unexplainable has happened and you're going to see that in the text tonight. It's just an amazing thing. Now God also does that for the New Testament church. He will make a way where there seems to be no way 
for a church to accomplish the things that God intends for that church to be able to accomplish. Now, having said that, let's go ahead and dive in, pick up in Acts chapter 5, verse 12. We're going to read a good bit tonight, but we, we don't want to separate this story. We want to keep it as a whole unit. Many signs and wonders were being done among the people through the hands of the apostles, those 12. By common consent, they would all meet at Solomon's Colonnade, the place where they could go and proclaim the word. None of the rest, of the da- none of the rest dared to join them. Uh, no re- you don't wonder why they were scared to come and join them after Ananias and Sapphira just dropped dead. But the people praised them highly. Believers were added to the Lord in increasing number and crowds of both men and women. And as a result... They would carry the sick out into the street and lay them on coats and mats so that when Peter came by, at least his shadow would fall on them. Now, we don't know that they got healed there, but we know that that's what they were trying to do. But at 16, they're going to get healed. Verse 16 says, In addition, a large group came together from the towns surrounding Jerusalem, bringing sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits, and they were all Healed. So the apostles healed all of these sick people that came to them. Then we see what happens in, in verse 17. Then the high priest took action. They got mad. They couldn't have this going on because it's messing with the, it's messing with the, uh, with the Judaism that the guy there. He and all his colleagues, those who belonged to the party of the Sadducees, that's the ones who didn't believe in the resurrection, who were totally against the resurrection, were filled with jealousy. So they arrested the apostles and they put them in the city jail. But, but, an angel of the Lord opened the door of the jail during the night, brought them out, and said, go stand in the temple complex and tell the people all about this life, this life being the the life of the way. In obedience to this, they entered the temple complex at the break of day, and they began to teach. They were told to go back and preach, get the same thing, go come back and do the same thing you're doing before you got arrested, go do it. They went out, they got out of jail, went back and did the exact same thing. Next, ver- or next, next part, it picks up. When the high priest and those who were with them arrived, they convened the Sanhedrin. Uh, if you were watching an old Western, they'd say, meanwhile, back at the ranch. <laughs> okay. The Sanhedrin doesn't know that just happened. So here, here they go. The full senate of the sons of Israel sent orders to the jail to have them brought. But when the temple police got there, they didn't find him in the jail, so they returned and reported, hey, we found the jail securely locked with all the guards standing in front of the doors, but when we opened them, we found no one inside. Someone came and reported to them, went inside. Verse 24, as the commander of the temple police and the chief police heard these things, they were baffled. Like, what about them? As to what came, uh, what, what could come of this? Someone came and reported them, hey, look, the men that you put in jail are standing in the temple complex and they're teaching the people. Then the commander went with the temple police and brought them in without force because they were afraid the people might stone them. Now, to stone them there is not the apostles. They were afraid that the people doing the arresting and bringing them would be stoned. So the crowds are all now in awe over what it is the apostles are doing. Verse 27, after they brought them in, they had them stand before the Sanhedrin, and the high priest asked, didn't we strictly order you not to teach in this name? And he lo- and look, you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are uh, determined to bring this man's blood on us. Now, I've got to stop and say something right here because this, yeah, this tickles me to death right here. That, uh, this, these, these people who are members of the Sanhedrin, do y'all remember what did they do? What personally did they do to Jesus Christ? They're the ones who had him crucified. Do you remember when they were fighting with Pilate and they said this statement, let his blood be on us. What a difference about 45 days has made. We don't want your blood on our hands. All right, that's what's going on right there. But Peter and the apostles replied, we must obey God rather than men. The government of our fathers raised up Jesus, 
which really ignites the Sanhedrin, because the, the Sadducees, because they don't believe in the resurrection, whom you had murdered by hanging him on a tree. God exalted this man to, to his right hand as ruler and savior to grant repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. We are witnesses to these things, and so it is the Holy Spirit. Remember, they don't believe in angels and all those kind of things. The Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. Now, the only way you can get the Holy Spirit is if you obey God, and they're not obeying God. <laughs> Verse 33, when they heard this, they were enraged, and they wanted to kill him. A Pharisee named Gamaliel, now, Gamaliel was one of the ones who, had, before this, is already training up a young protege by the name of Saul, uh, and he was teaching him at the local college, where they, the local divinity school, where he was learning the things that he was learning. Pharisees named Gamaliel the teacher of the law, who was respected by all the people, stood up in the Sanhedrin and ordered the men to be taken outside for a little while. Take his apostles and put them out so we can talk about this. And he said to them, now, the kind of picture of him is the old white-headed guy who's been around for a really, really long time. And when you get old and white hair, how many of y'all are old and have white hair? Okay. How many, some of y'all have a dark hair. Just raise your hand. Right, y'all must be using a can. Okay. All right. <laughs> that doesn't come in a can, does it? Uh, not dippity do, is it? Uh, how many of y'all old enough to remember dippity do? All right. Jim, you know, I know you didn't dippity do anything. Okay. All right. I don't know how I got off on that. Okay. Anyway, he's the old guy who's been around forever and he knows all this stuff. He knows history, and you know why he knows history? Because he lived history. All right. He was there when it happened. And he said to them, men of Israel, be careful about what you're going to do to these men. Not long ago, Thaddeus rose up claiming to be somebody and a group of about 400 men rallied around him and he was killed. And all the patrons were di dispersed and it came to nothing. And after this man, Judas the Galilean rose up in the days of the census and he attracted a following. That man also perished and all his parishioners, all his partisans were scattered. And now I tell you, stay away from these men and leave them alone. And this is his logic. For if this plan, if it, for if this plan or this work is of men, it will be overthrown. But if it is God, you will not be able to overthrow them. Let me ask you this question. How long ago was that written? Over 2,000 years ago. I think it's going to make it. I think you're exactly right. You may even be found fighting against God. So they were uh, persuaded by him. And after they called in the apostles and they had them flogged, they, ordered not, they were ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and release them. Then they went out from the presence of the Sanhedrin rejoicing that they were counted worthy to be dishonored on behalf of the name. Every day in the temple complex and in various homes, they continued teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. And all God's people said. Amen. And Jesus looked at Peter and he said, And upon this rock I shall build my church. In the gates of hell shall not prevail. Y'all remember that? Because when God gets ready to build the church, there's no holding the church back. And the effectiveness of the church is affected by the people and the holiness that they have in their lives. Here's what I think we can see in the text. The point number one is when the church is pure, God works wonders. When the church is pure, God works wonders. Uh, because Ananias and Sapphira are dead and all, the other, and all the other wonders that they've seen, these healings and everything that's taking place, all being seen, the people inside the church and outside the church are in fear and of awe. I don't know if you noticed the scriptures that we read today. Not only is the church in awe at the things that God is doing, but the people who are not a part of the church don't want to have anything to do with the church because they're in fear of how things are going to turn out too. They absolutely believe that there is a God. In their mind, there is no question 
that there is a God. And in their mind, there is no question that Jesus Christ has risen from the grave, but it's these Sadducees who are fighting them so desperately and a few of the Pharisees who have left around who are fighting them tooth and nail because they're jealous of the power that Jesus has and they actually want that power around them. There's no debate about that. And, and when there is some debate about whether Jesus Christ really is about the Son of God, there are such awe-inspiring things that are happening. The whole community agrees that he evidently he must be, he must be Christ. But now there may be some debate about whether people are willing to surrender to Jesus as Lord. But no debate over whether he is. Because the church is pure. Souls are being saved. And people are being healed by the apostles as they lay their hands on them. They also see the miraculous escape of these men from prison when to get the jail, the guards are still there and the doors are still locked and nobody even knew that they got out. And there is a glorious bond between the believers and they're willing to sell everything that they have just so they can make sure that each other is taken care of because they got a new purpose in life and as we talked about their new purpose in life last week was to be stewards of the economy to be stewards of, of, of the world to be stewards of, of love and the gospel and all of those things that we mentioned second point I think we can pull from the text is this when the church is pure they will endure persecution. I just want you to know that. Go ahead and say that with me. When the church is pure, it will endure persecution. Did Jesus promise the 12 disciples that they would see persecution? Yes. He absolutely did. And that promise is still true for us. And the reason for that is, is the world don't like us. Uh, the text we read tonight says, so they arrested the apostles and they put them in jail. The only reason that they went to jail was because they were preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're getting to a point in America where that's not real far down the corner. I, if, if the election had gone the other day, uh, other way, I believe that by this time we would already be seeing pastors thrown in jail across the United States of America. We don't know that this will last for a long time. We know that they're friendly towards us now, but we know that that is just around the corner and that time is coming. Coming. There's, a con there's a constant tension between God and the world authority. Now, who is the authority over the world today? Satan is. And there's a tension between him and God. The world authority is continually trying to take power and authority away from God but they can't do it, but they keep trying it, so it keeps causing tension, and it causes you and I to be persecuted in the middle of that. The world is under the influence of Satan, and he works as hard as he can to usurp and overthrow the will of God, but yet the will of God still always gets accomplished. Remember, it was Satan himself who tried to make sure that Jesus got killed, only to find out that killing Jesus Christ on the cross was the very thing that God intended to do to save our souls. This tension between God and Satan will cause the people of God to be persecuted by the world. They're going to hate us. They're not going to like us. In the end, God always, God has always and will always be victorious. And we, the chosen people of God, will endure and we will be blessed for it. I remember, you remember what it said? They went out of the Sanhedrin rejoicing that they were counted worthy to be dishonored. On, the, on behalf of his name. When you're, when you're, so, when you're so close to God, you, you consider it a blessing that you have an opportunity just to preach the gospel of God even if it costs you a few lashes on your back. Third point from the message I want us to look at tonight is this. The purified church witnesses the perplexity of the world's authority. I love this one. I love this point. As I, as I looked at the world is perplexed at how the church can keep on going and keep being who it's supposed to be. Now the Sanhedrin, was, the first case we see that is the Sanhedrin was perplexed as to how to deal with the apostles. After all, human power, wisdom, and reason are no match for the ways of God. So the Sanhedrin absolutely didn't know what to do. They whipped the apostles and they threw them in jail and then they told them when they got out to stop preaching the gospel and what did the apostles do? They went and preached the gospel. That was in the message last uh, two weeks ago on Sunday morning. Now we come back today, they get, they get thrown in jail for preaching the gospel and they get whipped and what do they do? 
they go back out and they start preaching the apostles. They, you can't control the apostles because the apostles are under the control of God and he's going to have the word of God preached and the word of God is going to be preached. And then you got the Sanhedrin, you got the Sadducees and a few of these Pharisees and they're trying to figure out how to work all of this thing out and they're completely complex until Gamaliel comes up and he comes up with this big idea and he said, he, said uh, he, give, he gives a good argument for the reality of Jesus. The way I read this is he proves that Jesus actually is the Son of God in the very text that's right here and he never intended to do that. But his thought is if you just let this Jesus thing run its course, in a few years everybody will die and it won't be anything to it. But as you mentioned a while ago, for 2,000 years, Instead of the church getting smaller and smaller and smaller, what's the church been doing? Getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and there's more people coming to the way of God. In all the places in the world where the church is persecuted and people are putting to death for Christ, those churches are not getting smaller in those countries. Those churches are getting bigger in those countries because people are being called to live for Christ. Fourth thing we can see in the text tonight is this. The purified church proclaims the gospel regardless of the personal cost to them. When you are where you ought to be with Christ, you're going to tell the people that you're talking to who Jesus is and what he has done and what he will do regardless of the cost. The text said every day in the temple complex and in various homes they continue to teach and proclaim the good news that Jesus is the Messiah, that he is the Christ. Those who, talk, who, those who walk in obedience with a pure heart see the wonder of God and they're willing to be used by God regardless of the personal consequences that come on their lives. Because you come to the conclusion as a Christian, you can either be in control of your life or Jesus can be in control of your life. And after you've been in control of your life for a little while, you find out that you're not really in control of your life. How many of y'all have figured that out? That no matter how hard you try, you can't control everything and the circumstances that are around you and you can't make anything happen. But when you start to trust God and you just live according to his word, then he starts making all this other stuff fall into place. The more holy you become, the more in love with Christ you get, the more you hate sin in your own life, the more you let that be pushed out of you by the power of the Holy Spirit and the grace that is in you, the more you begin to see the wonder of God and the things that he's doing around you. For the church, proclamation of the word is paramount. It's the number one thing that must happen. We study God's word behind closed doors and in small groups and we gather together and we talk about it and then we come together and we go out in the world and we proclaim the name of Jesus Christ everywhere that we can go and find just like the apostles did. Now your job is not just to come in here and soak up and listen to all the things that are being taught whether it be in a small group or whether it be in here. Your job is to go out and take the, take the Bible, take the word of God to your neighborhood. Now, I'm, I'm concerned about Ridgely. Here's one spot I'm concerned about Ridgely right now. We're not seeing a lot of converts right here in our own community. We got, we've seen the folks all over the world. We're seeing people come to Christ. But right now, we seem to be pulling back a little bit on the Jackson County, on Hurley, on Big Point, Moss Point, Pascagoula, and this area. We've got to have a greater impact in the area in which we live. And if we're going to do that, that means that y'all, how many of y'all are y'all? So who am I talking to? All y'alls. All y'alls. Okay. And me, we got to talk the gospel out there. We got to share. We got to share what the Bible has to say at work. Well, you say, well, I might lose my job at work. Yeah, you might. If you lose your job at work, I can promise this: God's got a better job for you somewhere else because He's going to take care of you because you've been sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay, what do we do with all this stuff that we've learned tonight? And I got six real quick personal lessons that we can take. Number one is purity and God's word go hand in hand. The more the church preaches, the, the more the church's practical holiness aligns with the positional holiness, the greater the works of God that they will see. The more of our people who get into a deeper relationship with Jesus Christ, the more of us who let Jesus Christ loose in our lives so that the sin comes out, so that grace really abounds in us and we become more effective in what we do the more we see God do these things that we can't explain, like unlocking prison doors and people coming out, we might, the more that we do, the more we will see of our family and loved ones being delivered from alcohol and drugs and all of these uh, pornography and all of these other things that come in our lives. 
our holiness will have an effect on our family and our friends' relationship with Jesus Christ. If we personally will become more holy, it will be a good thing for our families and everybody that we know. Second thing is this. The people of God always, always, always persevere under persecution. We always make it. Now, most often what God does is he delivers them from the persecution that they're in. It's Most of the time, it's going to be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Even if we get fired, we will not worship you, and if we do worship you, we want you to know that even if we die in this fire, we will not worship you. Did God deliver them from the fiery furnace? Yes, yes he did. All through Scripture, we see where people are doing the things that God has called them to do, and he delivers them. Now, sometimes he doesn't deliver people, and what happens is when he doesn't deliver people and somebody's executed for being a Christian, they fast forward to everything is as it should be, and they don't have to experience the pain and suffering that you and I experience as we're here on planet Earth today. Third personal truth, personal application here. The world is perplexed by the ways of God. The non-Christians are looking at us and saying, what? That doesn't make any sense. That doesn't make any sense why you would do that. You're not going to get ahead in the business world. Apart from belief, the word of God and the Holy Spirit, a person will never see and understand the works of God. The Sanhedrin couldn't understand why the church was being so successful. Gamaliel and, and, and all of those others, they couldn't figure it out. And they couldn't figure it out because it was way above their pay grade, because it was Jesus Christ that was making everything work out the way it does. As you go out and be the church, as you go out into the world and just do what you do, God's going to do amazing things way up the stream from you. It's going to cause things to work out the way that he wants them to work out, and he's going to use you all up in the middle of that. And he's going to bless you, and you're going to be blessed by him. Fourth. The people of God are to obey God even if it conflicts with the human authority. If God calls you to do something and morally you can't do it because the word of God says that you can't do it, then you can't do it, okay? If you were, for example, today, if, the, if you, you know that as is, is a Christian, you know it's morally wrong to kill somebody. You absolutely know that it's morally wrong to kill somebody. And if you happen to be a nurse and you work somewhere and you have to provide somebody with a shot to, to induce an abortion in that person, then you would have to step back and say, mm, I, I'm sorry, I can't do that because morally, according to the scriptures, I can't just provide somebody with an abortion on demand to, to do this process. And you might get fired because you tell them that you can't do that. But you can't do that. But what God's going to do is he's going to raise you up in a new place, in a better place, doing the thing that he wants you to do. That's just one example among thousands. Um, the next one uh, was on number four, was on number five. If I'm on number five, I'm further along in the sermon. Okay, four, okay, it was on number four. Okay, number five. Here, here's, let's see. Yeah, the world's perplexed. The people of God are to obey God. Number five, personal persecution will reserve, result in personal praise. Now, this, this is backwards. This is backwards. You're not praised because you got persecuted. You praise because you got persecuted. Right? Your brain gets rewired. And even though you get beat, even though you lose, even though momentarily things are worse for you, your brain is going, yes, I did it right. I got it. Now let me watch and see what God's going to do. And then God will do his thing. And it'll cause your brain to go, uh, it'll blow your mind. Number six, speak the word in boldness. Speaking the word in boldness will bring the opposition of worldly authority. Now I have found this to be true in my own personal life. The more I study the Bible, the better equipped I am to handle the word of God. And the better I handle the word of God, the more persecution we get from the outside world. And the better you get it interpreting it, and the better you get it living in the world, the more persecution we're going to get from the world because the world don't like the word of God. But God has got it. We may wind up locked in jail, but we're going to be happy, and he's going to make sure that we're okay. Isn't that an exciting thought? In the world's imagination, 
they would say, you're absolutely crazy. But because of God, the world is perplexed. God takes care of his people. Just like he took care of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, just like he took care of Peter, just like he took care of Paul, just like he takes care of John, he's going to take care of you. Know the word, live the word, and share the word. Dear God in heaven,